Come on, you said you wanted to be in a video. Come on. My hair it doesn't look pretty. Your hair is beautiful. I just got up from a nap. Your hair is beautiful. Come on. What's the song? It's about a meatball. <laughs> okay. Okay. On top of a pizza, all covered with cheese, I saw my first meatball till somebody sneezed. It rolled off the table and onto the floor. It rolled right out of the door. Please enjoy my stories or whatever else might be on my mind today. It rolled into the street and there it was smashed. It changed from a meatball to a pile of hash. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Lynn, have you been watching America's Got Talent? <laughs> People keep asking me if I've met Jerry Brown of Jerry Brown Travels on YouTube here in Ahihik. I had lunch with Jerry and Lori today. Very nice people. Well, since this channel is named JC Travel Stories, I thought it might be time to tell you some stories. I'm going to talk about uh, three bad hombres in Mexico. But they're not Mexicans. These are three people who came from the United States to hide out in Mexico. Uh, you hear about this all the time. There's lots of television shows about it. And I was thinking about this because I mentioned it in my last video that people are always seeing bad parts of Mexico when they see crime stories about people hiding in Mexico from the law. These are three real stories, and they're stories that I have personally uh, not been a part of, that's not the way to say it, but people that I actually met and knew here in Mexico. The first one, um, this will be the shortest one, uh, I played tennis. I took tennis lessons actually over in Chapala for uh, three or four months when I was down here for the very first time. And I played with a, um, a guy who um, was just a guy I practiced with. And let's say his name was uh, John. That wasn't his name. But let's say his name was John. And I played tennis with John for several months. And I came back the next year and I said, like, Where's John? Well, the year before, I had noticed one day when he had his shirt off that he had what appeared to be an injury down here in his abdomen. And it turns out that it was a bullet um, wound. And when I came back the next year, I said, well, John was deported because he was an escaped fugitive from the United States having been incarcerated for murder. Uh, there's a curious thing that Mexico does. Mexico will not deport, or I guess the word is um, extradite, people if there's a capital crime and a death penalty is a possibility in their sentencing. But they do something very, very different. What they will do is, in cooperation with the FBI in the United States, or federal marshals, they will declare the person in Mexico to be an undesirable person and deport them. So it's not an extradition proceeding, which uh, Mexico wouldn't do for a capital crime. Um, and it's a much faster process. And it's not one that the uh, perpetrator 
can mess around with in the courts. He can't like say, well, I don't want to be extradited and get a lawyer. When the country of Mexico decides that you're an undesirable and cancels your privilege or your visa or your tourist visa or your legal immigration status in Mexico, uh, they put you on a plane. And if there happens to be an FBI agent sitting next to you on the plane, when you land in the United States, you're arrested. No extradition proceeding. Works very well. And that's what happened to these other two people. Um, another one was actually a friend. And um, we kind of had a bonding because we were both from South Dakota. He grew up in South Dakota, and I grew up in South Dakota, and uh, in a group of 30 people, one Thanksgiving, we had Thanksgiving dinner together, he and his, his wife. Um, and as I said, uh, I considered them to be friends. And uh, he used to rent horses and take people on trail rides here up into the mountains, and even was very instrumental in developing some of the horse trails that go up into the mountains here at Ahihik, where you can you know, rent a horse and go for a horse ride. Well, one day, he's uh, on one of those with some guests who he, he's uh, um, touring up into the mountains on horseback, and a black SUV pulls up and some uh, plain clothes, black uh, dressed guys get out and drag him off his horse, throw him in the SUV and drive away. And his wife thinks he's being kidnapped. Well, it turns out that they were Mexican federales, and they put him on a plane, and he went back to Colorado because he was an escapee from the Colorado State Prison. So more of the story is, when I met him, I, when I first started talking to him in social circles about, I grew up in South Dakota, as I think back on it in reflection, I remember him getting very, very nervous. Another little side bit about that was when I called my relatives and I said, hey, and I'm not going to say his name, hey, when uh, so-and-so uh, got picked up down here, you know, he was a friend of mine and my relatives, some of whom in South Dakota are in the legal profession. I said, Jerry, what kind of people you hang around with down there? Well, the fact is that he was arrested for a white-collar crime, and he and his wife were very nice people. Uh, but nonetheless, he shouldn't escape from prison in Colorado and go off. But he went to Belize first, and uh, the guy that he worked for in Belize, he was kind of a, he was a horse wrangler kind of guy. And uh, the guy he was working for in Belize figured out who he was and threatened to report him if he didn't leave. So the guy in Belize, his, his former boss in Belize, before he came to Mexico, said, and it always reminded me of the, of the movie Forgiven with Clint Eastwood, where he comes back to the little town to revenge the poor treatment of the town prostitute, and he walks into the saloon and has a gunfight with 20 people, and kills them all, of course. Apparently it was 20 guys that couldn't shoot as good as him. And uh, he's riding out of town in the rain with his poncho on and the rain's dripping off of his hat. He's riding along on his horse as he's leaving town and he says, and if any of you SOBs come after me, I'm going to kill you. He's riding around. And I'm going to come back and kill your mothers. And your dogs. <laughs> anyway, when this guy left Belize, his boss says, yeah, he took off in the middle of the night with my pickup truck, and he took my dog, too. I don't know why it reminds me of that movie, but it does. <coughs> anyway, um, this was some years ago, and I think that some time was added to his 12 years to go on his sentencing in the Colorado State Prison, and he may be out by now, I don't know. Um, Anyway, that was uh, the second association I had with a person hiding out in Mexico. This happens. And we read about it in the paper, like, you know, terrible people who are hiding out in Mexico and get caught up with. And this next one, I will use his name, 
because you can go on the internet and look for this and you'll find um, some of the story, not all of it. His name was Perry Marsh, M-A-R-S-H, if you want to Google it. Perry Marsh uh, was from Tennessee. He was an attorney and uh, his wife disappeared. Uh, there was some suspicion, but he was never charged with the crime, and they couldn't prove anything, and he moved to Mexico, and he married a, a, a Mexican lady, and had some more children here in Mexico, and he used to run a restaurant here in Ajijic, actually it was on the corner in La Foresta, and I used to go there for lunch a lot because he made a fantastic burger stuffed with gargonzola cheese. Uh, we have since around town here... Uh, in the history of the story, come to call him the killer dude. <laughs> so, anyway, I used to really enjoy the Gargonzola burger from the killer dude. We didn't know he was the killer dude at the time. Anyway, same kind of thing. He got picked up one time and sent back to the United States, or deported, not extradited, and uh, wound up in uh, jail awaiting trial on murder in uh, Tennessee. Well, he had worked for his father-in-law, who owned a big law firm in Tennessee, and the father and, um, and mother, um, actually I think it was her, his wife's father and mother, had moved to Chicago, and so they were um, having a lawsuit to get his, his U.S. children, who lived with, here with him in Mexico, uh, getting custody of them. And his Mexican wife and his Mexican children, of course, stayed here in Mexico. Anyway, he's in jail in Tennessee awaiting trial for the murder of his wife. And he decides that he wants to eliminate the in-laws who are trying to get his American children or get custody of them. So he makes a deal with a fellow inmate that... Um, if he will, the inmate is getting released pretty soon, and if he will go to Chicago and kill the in-laws, um, then Perry Marsh's father, who lives down here in Chapala, could set the guy up with a wonderful retired life down here, living the good life in Chapala. Well, the guy in the next cell, who's going to be released from uh, uh, prison soon, decides, to, of course, immediately that that's a get-out-of-jail-free or at least a get-out-of-jail-early card and goes and talks to the authorities. So the FBI and this guy set up a sting operation. He calls the father down here in Chapala, Perry Marsh's father, and he says... The deed is done. I have killed the Chicago in-laws. I'm at the airport in Guadalajara. Will you please come pick me up? And of course, this is a, a, a collusion between Perry Marsh and his father. So Perry Marsh's father comes to the airport in Guadalajara, and of course he is arrested, or again, deported, along with... Uh, FBI and federal marshals sitting next to him in the plane and when they land, land in Memphis he is arrested for a conspiracy to commit murder. So now we have both Perry Marsh and his father in prison in Tennessee awaiting trial. One for murder and the other one for conspiracy to commit murder. Perry Marsh's father decides to cooperate and starts uh, uh, talking about having helped Perry roll up the body of his wife who has been missing now for all these years in a carpet and disposing of the body, turning on his son in order to get a little leniency, apparently. Or maybe he just had a coming to Jesus and wanted to fess up, who knows. Anyway. He dies before his trial comes to pass, and Perry Marsh is convicted of murder and is serving life in a prison in Tennessee. I like telling the story, but 
I do miss the Gargonzola burgers. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up. And please subscribe and hit that little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed what was on my mind today.